Hi, I'm Phil Keller of Metrolab. I'd like to tell you about a technology for measuring magnetic fields called flux meters. A oh, very well tech- known technology. These have been used to measure magne- magnetic fields since the 19th century. Uh, science museums still have lots of these beautiful instruments, uh, usually associated with a flip coil to uh, measure the uh, Earth's field quite accurately. Modern flux meters don't look lot much like these uh, instruments of yesteryear, but they still hold an important place in the panoply of options that we have for measuring magnetic fields. If we look at where they are in this categorization of magnetic field measurement techniques, where we categorize all the techniques with the, along the horizontal axis, the range that they cover, and on the vertical axis, the precision that they can achieve, we see that flux meters have a pretty impressive place for being such a, uh, shall we call it, say it, uh, well-respected uh, place in, in history. Uh, they uh, achieve remarkable precision, second only to NMR and ESR, and cover a wide range of fields that is absolutely second to none. So, These are very flexible instruments, but that flexibility comes at a price. You really have to know what you're doing uh, with uh, with a flux meter because it is a relatively complex device. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, some of these complexities. We're going to talk about some of the applications. And just to give you a short overview of what all you can do uh, with these devices. So let's start with a simple scenario. On the left, we have a strong field uh, region, strong field, uh, strong magnetic field that tapers off to a zero field region on the right. And our job is to find, to measure the uh, magnetic field strength, the flux density on the left-hand strong field region. There are various ways to uh, attack this problem, even with a flux meter. But Let's say we decide to use a moving uh, coil. So we could start with the moving coil in the strong field region and move it out to the zero field region, measuring the voltage as we do that move. This voltage is induced by the flux changing in the coil as we uh, move from a high field region to uh, to a low field region. And we integrate that flux to find the total change over the whole path. Now, an interesting point is, it doesn't matter which path I could take. I could move directly, or I could take a couple of detours, I will end up uh, with the same answer, which is a pretty remarkable statement. The last step is then to divide that integral by the area of the coil to convert the total flux change into a, fl- uh, total, a, to a flux density change. Uh, so we now know what is the flux density change as you move from the high field region to the low field region. And if you think you know that the low field region is at zero, you actually have an absolute measurement of the flux density in that high field region. So let's take a quick look at the math behind all this, because you're not going to avoid math uh, when you're using flux meters. Now, Faraday said that the voltage induced in our uh, coil is simply equal to the time rate of change of the flux that in, our, uh, in our coil. And he threw in a minus sign just uh, for convention. Now, the flux, by definition, is the integral of the flux density over the area of the coil. And if the air, if the coil just consists of n turns of a, an area that we're calling small a, uh, then the total area is simply n times a. And if the flux is, uh, flux density is constant across that area, then the total flux in the coil is simply n times a times the perpendicular component of the flux density, which I called their B perpendicular. Because it's important to remember that uh, coils are field-sensitive or direction-sensitive uh, devices. They only measure 
the direction, the component of the field that is along the axis of the coil. Now, the expression for the voltage is just the time rate of change of all that. And since the area of the coil, the number of turns, is a constant, we hope, we can just factor those out, and what we're left with is just the time rate of change of the flux density. We do some cranking, and the uh, next couple of lines show you we take the integral uh, to get rid of that, uh, that derivative, and what we end up with is finally an expression um, for the flux density, uh, which very importantly on the right-hand side of the equation has the integral, the time integral of the voltage, and that you divide by the total area of the coil. Okay? So that's th lots of simplifications in through there, but that is the basic equation that is most, uh, that is applicable to, to, to using flux meters. Okay, in my introduction, I've talked about one scenario uh, for using flux meters. That's a moving coil. But there's lots others. So the first one is that moving coil. This is used to um, mo measure the flux change from a, of one area relative to another area, okay, as we've seen. Now, there's another way that we could have measured uh, the, the, the flux density at that particular point. We could have flipped the coil. And since the flux changes from being positive to being negative, we have twice the flux uh, when we flip it. And uh, by measuring uh, that flux change and dividing by two, uh, we can find the, uh, the, uh, the, the flux density at that particular point. Another configuration is the moving wire configuration. This is often used for very narrow gaps when you have to fit through uh, the north and south pole of a magnet that's only separated by a millimeter where you can't fit a coil in there. This is often the only solution. So the, the idea here is that the area of the coil that we're talking about is actually the area swept out by, uh, the, um, uh, by the wire as it goes through the gap. We also can use just a plain static coil. This is useful uh, if we have a, an alternating field, an oscillating field, that induces a voltage in this uh, static coil just sitting there. Now, one very important feature of flux meters is that you can get a field map practically for free. For example, what I've shown here is a moving wire, and as we move the wire, we, get, uh, we are interested not just in the final result when we've gone all the way through uh, the magnet. We're going to save the partial integrals as we move the wire through the magnet. And what we get then is a profile of the field as we move that wire through, uh, through the gap. This slide shows an application that is very common in particle accelerator labs. Here we're not talking about a uh, field map is in a linear dimension. We're talking about a field map as you rotate a coil in uh, uh, the gap of a magnet. By taking a Fourier transform of, this, um, uh, of these measurements, we find a, we, we calculate a multipole model for this particular ma uh, magnet. The first order one, which is just the sine wave, is the dipole component. How uh, does this magnet bend the beam? The second component is the quadrupole moment which tells us how this magnet focuses the beam, and so forth. Now, often, the sci uh, scientists measure up to 17th, 18th uh, order uh, to, uh, to, to be able to comp include all the effects that this magnet will have on the beam. One extension of the rotating coil measurement is... The, the concept of bucking coils. Now, the idea here is that, let's say you were measuring a dipole magnet, 
but we okay we know what the dipole field is that we can measure with uh, with an NMR magnetometer what we're really interested in are all the error components the quadrupole hex uh, uh, sextupole etc octupole etc components so what we'd like to do is beat down the dipole um, uh, uh, component down to a reasonable level uh, so that it doesn't drown out all these other multipole measurements. The way we do that is we use this sort of a figure eight uh, coil, okay? And as you rotate that, the flux is positive in one direction and negative in the other direction, and it turns out that exactly cancels out the dipole component and therefore lets you to focus the full dynamic range of your flux meter on the higher order components, uh, on the error components. So far, we've talked a lot about coils, but coils are just one half of, the, uh, uh, of a flux meter. The other half is the voltage integrator. So usually a voltage integrator is just a classic analog integrator as we see right here. But more and more, um, as the performance of ADCs uh, improves, we can use digital integration where we uh, convert or digitize the signal at the front end and then the integral just becomes a numerical sum. Both techniques have their advantages and their disadvantages. The analog, the limitations of the analog um, integrators are well known. First of all, the size of the capacitor there, the C, limits the lowest frequencies, the lower end of the bandwidth of the voltage integrator. You also have problems with noise, leakage current, uh, temperature dependence that all need to be carefully, uh, carefully managed. Last but not least, usually want a digital output at the end, so in any case, you have to put in an ADC. The limitations of the digital integrator are also quite well understood. First of all, the Nyquist limit limits the upper limit of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the bandwidth, so the highest frequency that you can pass. Also, you might get quanti uh, quantization uh, problems if your uh, dynamic range isn't sufficient. And last but not least, you are totally dependent on the linearity of your ADC. So that's a very brief overview of the flux meter technology. This is a complex and uh, well-established uh, technology with a large established uh, body of knowledge. So it, it does take quite a while to, uh, to, to become competent uh, in using uh, this, uh, this technique. And there's no way that my little overview here can, uh, uh, can, can do that for you. But I hope at least I've given you enough information to whet your appetite and uh, look a little further at this, uh, at this outstanding technology. Thank you for listening.